one of the first ones we did in Philly uh, was with a hand uh, gun that we found in an abandoned house. And we had a bunch of moms and dads there who had lost their kids. So we said, you know what? Instead of just our blacksmiths, let's, let's, invite, let's invite the moms and dads, you know? And they took the hammer. And I will never forget as this one mother began, she had a picture of her son on her jacket and she just began pounding on this gun. And with every thump of the hammer, she said, this is for my boy. Hello, friends, and welcome to the Let's Give a Damn podcast. On this podcast, you'll meet amazing damn givers, and you'll find the hope and the tools to give more dams than ever before. My guest today is Shane Claiborne. If you don't know him, you're in for a treat. A little over a week ago, we met at the Capitol Building in downtown Nashville, where he and a group of people were camped out to ask Governor Bill Lee to intervene in the execution of Stephen West by electric chair that was to take place last week here in Tennessee. Sadly, that state-sanctioned murder did take place last Thursday evening, but I will not stop fighting for the abolition of the death penalty, and I know Shane Claiborne won't stop fighting either. In this conversation, we talk about so much more than the death penalty, but that is a huge chunk of it, given the circumstances under which we were recording this podcast conversation. Shane does a fantastic job introducing himself and his work in our chat, so let's get right into it. Here's my conversation with my friend and one of my heroes, Shane Claiborne. Shane Claiborne, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, man. I, we haven't done it like this before. Here no. we are, man. We're right outside the Capitol and yeah, the, yeah, in this the is, sun. Yeah, paint the, paint the scenario we're in right now for people because, yeah, so you said state capital, Nashville, Tennessee. We'll get to why you're here in a moment, but real quickly, because we're right behind you and right in front of me, 30 feet are two men yeah. that came to join you today for uh, this March for Mercy. Who are they? Because their stories are incredible. You, you came and sat down and said, those guys are heroes. And it, it truly is just yeah. mind blowing. Well, What's I mean, going on 30 feet these guys behind are, us? Yeah, they're heroes. They're, they're, they're both folks that have seen the brokenness of the criminal justice system because they were wrongfully convicted. And one of them, uh, Adam, spent 12 years in, incarcerated on a, like, I think it was like a 50 year sentence or He's something. He's a 51, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, uh, for a crime that he had nothing to do with. And, and Anthony um, was a similar case that he uh, was convicted of a crime he had nothing to do with and um, spent 16 years in there. And now what, what I was just hearing, which is awesome, is that he's gone to law school. Uh, he's got a master's degree already, but now he's going to pass the bar um, and become a lawyer to, to defend folks uh, that need good lawyers. So that's that's insane. Using, using, <laughs> using their own wounds to heal the world, man. Well, the, yeah. first, the first guy you talked about, what was his name? Sorry. The Adam. first guy, Adam. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, he just uh, got out nine days just got ago. Out nine days ago. Yeah, talking about the first hamburger he had when he got out, you know. But. And his response, which is just just crazy to me, is now I've got to give back. Yeah. He said that just a few minutes ago, and I was like, "Give what?" what? Well, like he talked about like how when he got out, the first thing he wanted was a big, like really good hamburger. Yeah. And he's like, "But even as he was taking his first bites, he couldn't eat it because he's thinking about the guys inside." And I mean, that's, that's where he's at right now. He's like, I cannot forget those guys. I can't forget the folks uh, that are wrongfully convicted, but also the, the redemption stories, you know, he, like the, the folks that have done something, but they're, they're different people than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So he, he's gonna become a, a part of that restorative justice work, you know, and so it's just awesome. Yeah. We've got so much we're going to get into here today. For the few people listening to this podcast that don't know who the hell you are, can you give us a framework? Uh, I know who you are, and I'll, I'll give you my first impression. <laughs> um, and I, I don't remember it too well, but I remember back in you know t- uh, mid two thousand, like two thousand six or seven, when your book came out. Right, people were talking about the Shane Claiborne guy, and they were talking about how I mean, everybody was talking about you as if you were some off the wall, just crazy radical, right? Mm. So, something that we shouldn't like. Okay, it's cool what he's doing, but that's not like for me, that's not for us. And he's just out there doing his thing and not really making much sense out of it. And so I, for years, I knew who you were. I knew your name. I knew the things that you had done and were doing. I didn't pay too much attention to it. And I regret that wholeheartedly now because I see that there, there's been a consistent thread through all that you've done. And it's beautiful and it's remarkable. And you have consistently called people to 
a much better version of living than oh, most sweet, of us man. than that's most sweet. of us are living. And so I'm so excited to get into this conversation with you. But again, for those that don't know who you are, kind of take us up to maybe cut short of the last couple of years so we can talk about you know why you're even here in Nashville and all of that. But just give us the give us the give us the whole thing. Who is Shane Claiborne? Yeah, man. Well, first of all, I, I, this is my home state, so I grew up a little east of here. Like I, I grew up outside of Knoxville. Um, Where exactly? Uh, Maryville. Yep, Maryville High School. So my, this is gonna <laughs> be this is gonna went. be wild. My in-laws live in Maryville, Tennessee. Yeah. So they, well, I we're should. Pro- we're probably cousins, man. <laughs> who knows? Well, no, no, no. So none of us are from oh, the in-laws. south. Yeah, it's been maybe. and it's been it's been a. Our families have moved to the south over the years. Most of most of our family members, but. Yeah, he's been a, a, a Walmart employee for a, a manager at Walmart for twenty something years, and they moved in there like ten years ago. Yeah, man. So yeah, Maryville, Tennessee is where they're. So I know exactly where that is. We're going next weekend. We go, you know, so, often. Well, you know it. Then it's a small town. Yep. It's got its charm, Southern hospitality. You know, sitting on the in the rocking chair, sipping sweet tea. Very whatnot. much so. I mean, and I I learned a lot about love and hospitality there, but it, it also has its. Um, yet to be redeemed pieces. You know, I mean, it was a segregated town. Our high school had the Confederate flag on everything. Mm. I mean, it was the Maryville High School Rebels, you know, um, and you know, it was on football uniforms, everything. So, you know, as I came out of that, I hung on to the things that are beautiful and I, I wanted to see a, the, the world outside of that. So I went to Philly and um, studied at Eastern University right outside of Philadelphia. So I studied sociology and I studied the Bible. Um, because I like how there's a, you know, one of the great thinkers of the church, Carl Bart, he said, we've got to hold the Bible in one hand, but we need to have the newspaper in the other, or else our faith can just become a ticket into heaven and a excuse to ignore the world we live in, you know? So, so that, and that's a lot of the Christianity I grew up in was about going to heaven when we die. And I'm excited about heaven, but also like when I read the things that Jesus talked about, he talked about not just going up when we die, but bringing God's dream down while we live, like caring for widows and orphans, welcoming immigrants and refugees, a stranger, all this stuff, you know? So it wasn't just about preparing us to die, but teaching us how to live and how to love. And so that's what I've been after, you know, for 20 years now in Philly, we've been building a community on the north side of Philly, very holistic. I mean, right now we're the fire hydrants are open and the streets are closed. We literally can close our block to cars so the kids can have a place to play, you know, in the street. Amazing. We're painting murals. We got community gardens. We're renovating abandoned houses. So it's just building, uh, we say, uh, building a neighborhood that we're proud to call home, you know, and we're challenging the things that squash people's hope and dignity, um, gun violence, the, and the criminal justice system that we're, you know, kind of talking about right here. You're trying to give people a, a visual for what a better life or the simple way, a, a better way of living is, right? In a place that is just ridden with poverty and violence. And so many things have happened in Philly, right? It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's quite the place. It's well, an amazing there's, place. There's but. things I love about my neighborhood, you know, so I don't ever want to paint it terrible. I mean, you know, in, in Philly, there are a lot of people that call Kensington, my neighborhood, uh, the Badlands. But I always uh, tell them that, that that's exactly what they said about Nazareth, where Jesus came from, is nothing good could come from there, you know? <laughs> and so we see, like, I mean, I, I think a lot of neighborhoods that have been economically devastated um, are rich in community. And a lot of, Absolutely. you know, wealthy, economically wealthy areas are, are poor in community because you kind of lose this sense of Very needing each other. Yes. So I love my neighborhood. But yeah, I mean, we, we, we've lost 100,000 jobs. We've got abandoned buildings everywhere. We've got, uh, we, we still suffer from the, the epidemic of gun violence. Almost every corner of our neighborhood, we remember the stories of who died there. And we've got murals to, you know, prove it. So it's, it's uh, these are not just issues to me. They're, they're. Um, or statistics, their their names and faces of folks that, uh, like with gun violence or even with the death penalty and these things are, they're um, they, they they've become very personal because, I think proximity uh, makes the uh, the world a difference. You know, if if we're not proximate to those who are suffering from injustice, then it just remains kind of a one of many issues that we can choose to care or not care about. Yeah, and it's so easy to hate and discriminate and judge from afar, isn't it? Right, right, yeah. Oh, those people in Philly or Iraq or Afghanistan or El Paso, right? It's so easy to say, look at them, look what they're going through. When you get to, and this applies for not just people that we want to help or that we think are, you know, suffering in some way, the people that we don't, this is what I've been trying, this is what I've been going through, 
is I want to make sure that I always make room at the table for the person that I vehemently disagree with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I because think we're, very, we're really good at talking uh, about people but not talking to people, Amen. you know, especially people directly affected. Like uh, Mother Teresa, who I love, I mean, she, I, got, I got a chance to work with her and the nuns in Calcutta, and she, she really helped shape a lot of my own spirituality. But one of the things that she said is it can be very fashionable to talk about the poor but not very fa- fashionable to talk to them. And I think that's the same with like, you know, we talk about Muslims, but how many Muslim friends do we have? You know, we talk about immigrants, but that's not, they're not issues, they're neighbors to be loved. And so that's what, you know, happened for me around a lot of these, these issues is, is that they, they, you know, became people that uh, are affected by these things. Let's not gloss over what you just said, uh, that you had the opportunity to work with Mother Teresa uh, for what, yeah. 10 weeks, right? Yeah, quite a few weeks. The first time I was over there. How does one happen upon working with Mother? You know, we all know Mother. Everybody that's listening right now knows, conceptually, has read a quote or you know, read an article or something about her. But I guarantee you, no one that's listening has been able to work with her. So, like, tell me about that experience. That that had to be wild. We're we're in the middle of uh, college and. The good thing about being 20 years old is nobody's convinced you that anything's impossible, you know? So we're, we're talking about what are we going to do this summer? And, um, you know, we're thinking who is really living out their Christianity and their faith in a way that is compelling and beautiful? Because there's lots of people who got bumper stickers and T-shirts, but who's like really reading the Sermon on the Mount and trying to live that out? Things like, you know, sell what you have and give it to the poor. And Mother Teresa was alive obviously back in the you know 90s and and so we we wrote her a letter and then we ended up just picking up the phone and calling some nuns and uh got a number for M- mother Teresa's order in india and uh, folks that knew her aren't very surprised by this but i sure was when we called she picked up the phone you know and and uh I'm expecting a receptionist or something. Mother yeah. Teresa picks up the phone. She's, like, you'd expect that up? she's multiple, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. removed from the conversation. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, kind of cut, cut, um, caught off guard. And I said, well, we, we're trying to figure out, you know, how to follow Jesus, how to love our neighbors. Uh, we, we, we're free this summer. Can we, do you have internships or something, right? And she's like, I'll just come on out. So we did. We, we A group of my college friends and I went and we lived in uh, India. And yeah, man, I mean, it was it was just shattered my world in the best way like I I, I really um um I worked in the orphanages every morning I worked in the um her first home the home for the dying uh every afternoon where we just bring people off the streets who were dying we'd hold their hands and almost every day people Mm. would die but it was it was holy work you know and and Mother Teresa used to say uh what's important isn't how much we do, but how much love we put into doing it. So don't concern ourselves with doing great things, but doing small things with great love. And that's mm. really what moves the world. So uh, even our name of the community I'm with in Philly, The Simple Way, Mother Teresa wrote a simple a book called The Simple Path. And, you know, that's really what um, uh, happened for us is we, we um, started our community trying to live some of that same, uh, sp- you know, work in Philly. Yeah, so The Simple Way, you have talked in so many different ways and you've not just talked but you have expressed uh in your behavior and in your life a simple way talk about that i mean you at one point there was a fire that took all your possessions right but then you have not accrued a tons of possessions you have <laughs> kept a very, very simple life. And it's very attractive to me. We're a minimalistic family. Awesome. I wear yeah. the same thing every single day. I wear black jeans and a black t-shirt every day. People know this. Um, I have one hat. It's like an iconic hat that everybody knows. It's my ball cap that I wear. Like, I believe in that. I believe yeah. in that so deeply because on, on the one hand, it's made me realize how little we need. Yeah, yeah, How yeah. few things we need. But on the other hand... You got the Johnny Cash it thing is, going here, don't you? Yeah, it is. Wearing all black. Yeah, that's right. Just, <laughs> yeah. I, it, it works because yeah. if I spill something on my clothes, it doesn't show. I'm not going to go around in white. I never thought black of that. Just, Maybe I need to go. You know, all, yeah, Black is good. It hides so much. It's so warm so if, out here, it, though, in the sun. But. Yes. Yes, it is. You're probably better off than I am right now. But um, yeah. So, yeah, so I believe that because it's also squashed so much material as materialism or the desire for things rises up. I have very little room to uh, respond to it because I have kind of built this simple life around myself and my wife and our three kids and we're all into it, right? But tell us about what you've learned about the simple life. You even, is it true that you make 
some some or all of your own yeah, clothes. Yeah, a lot of them. I made these shorts here and whatnot. You know, I don't branch, I don't branch out on my pattern much either. So they all look it's pretty, pretty much yeah, the same. pretty, pretty Even much my the shorts same. Are just my pants that are shorter. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> you just same don't go pattern, as long right? with it. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. No, man. I, I I've got this uh, little comic on my office wall of these two nuns. You know, in their habits, uh, in their you know their religious attire, and, yep. and, and the one nun says to the other, "What are you wearing today?" And the, you know, the other one's like. Yeah, pretty much the same thing, you yeah. know, every day. Like, but there's something freeing about, like, literally when Jesus says, consider the lilies and the sparrows. They don't worry about what they're going to wear or how they're going to eat. And there's something freeing, I think, when, and, and even radically um, critical of our consumeristic, materialistic world, when Jesus says, even Solomon, King Solomon, in all of his splendor, wasn't dressed as beautifully as the lilies of the mm. field, you know? And... And, and so I, I think I learned this, the freedom of simplicity, um, that like, this is not just about kind of this virtuous, uh, uh, anti-materialist life. It's about freedom. You know, I don't have to worry about what I'm going to wear. I wear the same stinking thing every day. You know, I'm I, like, I love making stuff. So making clothes is, is awesome. And I also now know where they come from, that there's not, you know, kids abused in some uh, sweatshop in Honduras or El Salvador, you know, like making our clothes. So that, that's what I'm, you know, all that is a part of it, but it's, uh, Mother Teresa, she like pretty much had everything in, in a little box that she owned, you know, and she used to say things like, sometimes the things that we own begin to own us. Our possessions possess us. We have, the more we have, the more we find ourselves needing to maintain. So we have all this stuff and we hide behind it, you know, and, and it becomes like our, we're, we're, uh, we're constantly maintaining all this stuff and it keeps us away from what we're created for, to love and be loved. We kind of hide ourselves from community behind picket fences and cubicles and screens of, you know, technology and all that. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's about being free. And one of my memories of that um, from India I know we're going to talk about other stuff, but I, I mean, there's one thing that just shaped how I think about yeah, stuff, which please. was, I got this little kid who was, uh, uh, one of the little kids that begged every day. I got him an ice cream cone. It was like a hundred and something degrees, you know, so it was his birthday. So I got him an ice cream and he gets it and he's so excited that his impulse is to share it. Like, this is too good to keep for myself. And so he yells at all the other kids that were begging on the street, like a hundred of them come around and get a lick. everybody gets a lick. Wow. And, um, and, and I think that's like, it's not that this ice cream's terrible. It's that it's so good that we want to share it. And so when Dorothy Day of the Catholic Worker Movement, so many, what they say is like the best thing to do with the best things in life is give them away. Yeah. And I think it's also just a, a sensible way to live. I mean, yep. I, you know, it's, it's crazy to think that we can continue to try to live into the patterns that we're consuming right now, you know, where the average American's consuming the same as 500 people in Africa. We know all the stats, you know, but at the end of the day, it's like, it's, it's not that I feel guilty. I feel alive, you know, like in, in the way that we live right now. And It's very um, freeing. Yeah. We say in, in our community, like simple living doesn't mean ugly living. No. You can still live beautifully. Yep. We can have all kinds of creative stuff we do with our, our homes and our lives. And, um, and, and um, yeah, so the simple way is how we I roll. I love it. I love it. So I'm looking at a sign right now that says hashtag March for Mercy. Blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. Uh, Jesus said that. There's names on this sign, uh, and you guys are here in Nashville, this trip anyway, for what? Yeah, so this this is another execution week in Tennessee. Yes. Um, I think it's Thursday that the, there's another execution plan. And it's important that Tennessee is one of those states that was on the brink of really seeing no execution. I mean, for a decade, there were no executions in Tennessee, and they just started up again last year with the electric chair, too, in Tennessee as one execution method. It's wild. And so these guys, because it's my home state, I'm down here a lot, and I've had the chance for years and years to visit these guys. It's a pretty unique facility at Riverbend where I've gotten to know a lot of the men on death row. Um, one of them I got to be there for his ordination. He's an ordained minister, and... I mean, I, I get choked up, but, you know, he told his whole testimony of who he was and who he's become, what Jesus has done in his life. And, and then as he was ordained, his first act of being an ordained minister was to service all communion on death row. Wow. And, you know, all the, the guards and everything are looking on too, you know? And so, I mean, I've had some amazing experiences there. And one of them was, um, and part of what prompted what we're doing right now was several years ago, I had met with the governor 
um, because he was facing the possibility of executions. And this is the uh, governor, Bill Haslam. So he's a past governor. And um, I talked to him about the death penalty. And then I went to visit the men at Riverbend on death row. Several of them had execution dates on their lives. So I said to them, you know, I just, I just got to talk to the governor, but I wonder what you would say if you had a chance to talk to the governor. And the first, it is a little quiet, you know, everybody's thinking. And mm-hmm. the first guy to speak says, I had to ask the governor if he would come pray with us mm-hmm. and come hear our stories of redemption of what God's done in our life. Total, I mean, like, I'm just stunned. And all the other guys go, yeah, that's the best thing that could happen, right? And so we've been actually inviting, offering that invitation um, and the, it's grown. So now there are over half of the men on Tennessee's death row, 32 of the 55 men have signed this letter. So that's what their names are, the 32 signatories on this. And the letter's really simple. It's one line and it says, we have heard that you are a man of faith. Please come and pray with us. And it's of course to Governor Bill Lee. Yes. And, and that's our hope is that as we, we you know, carry this we're going to deliver it tomorrow morning as the the governor's office uh, opens and um we think that's an incredible human request and it's really sincere and i i believe if he visits them he'll be moved like i have by the by the stories of of what you know who these men are one of them um terry he says i i am not proud of who i used to be but I'm so proud of who Jesus has created me to be now. Mm. And we're, we're all more than the worst thing that we've done, you know? And so the, 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 really the death penalty for me as a Christian, like raises one of the most fundamental questions, which is, is anybody beyond redemption? You know, even with the questions of innocence aside, I mean, these guys that are here with me are, are, were innocent of the crimes they were convicted right, of. Right, the two that we talked about But then about there's the other folks yeah. that they, they did do it. And the question is like, do we believe in redemption? And so, you know, that's where a lot of my heart on this comes from, um, is, is, is believing that. And, you know, there's a precedent too in Tennessee of a governor, I think it was Governor Clement, uh, that went to visit death row and um, had been for the death penalty. And then he visited the guys and that, that you know, the stories and the proximity to that. He Going just, back to the human, humanizing yeah, He walked issue. away and said, you know what? I'm not going to execute anybody. And, and that's ultimately our hope, you know. And it's happened in states like in Pennsylvania. We have the death penalty, but our governor has just said, no, I don't I don't want to do that. And I don't want to make people kill someone. Because like, what we don't often think about is all these guys at Riverbend, you know, the, the guards are going to be have to have to take the life of someone that a lot of times they've seen, you know, really um, – gotten to know over 10, 20 years, and they've seen the person that they are, they are and, and uh, that, that more than just the crime they were convicted of. And it's, it's incredible to think of, um, of what it does to them, you know. What's been the, re- y- y- you are very open about the things that you're involved in. You share a lot on social media. What's the response from, from everyone really, but specifically of people of faith that you would expect would be overwhelmingly on the side of no death penalty. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. Like, what's what's typically the response? Is it is it hopeful, or is or are there days where you're like, how can people respond this way? Yeah, yeah. What is the general response, and how do you stay, how do you stay hopeful in the midst of just interacting with people in person and online about these pretty intense issues? Yeah. So I mean, so even just yesterday, what we did was we walked from Riverbend, where death row is, and it's also where the execution chamber is. We walked um, over eight miles to where we are now, right? The Mm. front door of the governor's office at the Capitol. And as we're walking, people are getting out of their cars and yelling, yes, yes. You know, they're, I mean, honking, I mean, semi trucks, everything, right? Um, Old people, young people. And almost without exception, everything that we heard was affirming this call for mercy and for alternatives to the death penalty. One of the signs that we have here says, uh, we need to remember the victims, but not with more killing. Yeah. So that, that's really our message. Yeah. We can do better than killing yes. to try to show that killing. Yes. But man, I think I do have a really heavy heart right now because we were just down here a few weeks ago. Yes. And it was Governor Lee's first execution that yep. he faced as a new governor. And it was a dear, very close friend of mine, someone that I've visited over and over, and I've, I've met his daughter. Um, the man was convicted of killing his wife. Don Johnson was convicted of killing his wife, and I believe he did, actually. And yet I've seen like what God's done in him. I've seen the, 
the uh, attempt to really build a, a stronger relationship with his daughter, who, when he was convicted, was for the death penalty um, because her mother was killed. And she, she hated her dad at first. Mm. And she said, but I began to see that the hatred wasn't hurting him, but it was destroying me. And I needed a different way forward. So they began to build a relationship, um, Don and his estranged daughter, who called in during his execution um, as one of the most outspoken people against it, you know. And, and so anyway, that, that moved me. And then we watched him, Governor Lee, take the life of this, this, this man that I was with three days before his execution. And uh, I asked him, how you doing, Don? And he goes, I'm too blessed to be stressed. Unbelievable. Three days before. And his faith, you know, as he's, he's pra- he, we prayed together. He prayed for Governor Lee. He prayed for all of us to continue to work to champion, you know, uh, uh, the cause of abolition of the death penalty and for mercy. Um, and then um, when he was given his final meal, Don Johnson um, asked that he be able to fast, to go without food, and that the $20 allotted to his final meal go to the homeless to feed someone who's on mm. the streets. And then as his execution went forward, he asked for forgiveness for the people he'd hurt, and he said extended forgiveness to the folks that were getting ready to take his life. And then he asked the warden, can I sing a song, a hymn, as I'm executed? He wanted his last words to be worship to God. And so he sang a, an old song that's familiar to some of us in the church, but it says, uh, I'm going to see the king. And there's no more crying there. I'm going to see soon the king. Soon and very soon. Yeah, soon and very song. soon. There's, uh, there's no more dying there. I'm going to see the king. And so soon and very soon was the last thing he said as his life was taken by the state of Tennessee, by a Christian governor. So that's heavy. And for very. me, part of why I got involved with the death penalty is that I saw tragically the only way that the death penalty has survived in America uh, is because of Christians. And, and in fact... Wow. Um, 85% of executions are in the Bible Belt. We often say the Bible Belt is the death belt. And you think of Texas and now Tennessee, these states that are executing have the highest concentration of Christians in the country. And to me, it's a contradiction of everything that Jesus died for and taught and lived. I mean, he, the words on our sign here say, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And uh, so that that's really what we're what we've been trying to have is a, a better version of justice that actually um, honors Jesus a little bit more. I mean, it just, just boggles my mind that we talk about being pro-life so often, but we just talk about the issue of abortion. And, and one of the things I love about Mother Teresa and Martin Luther King and now Pope Francis is that they talk consistently about what it means to be for life. It's not just about one issue, but um, it's very difficult to say we're pro-life and to be at the same time pro-death penalty or pro-guns or pro-military. <laughs> do you think that your work and others doing the work that you're doing, do you think the needle's moving on this whole, you know, like truly pro-life position? I do, right? man. I do. I mean, I, th- I think that we've got, we've got a, we got a political crisis in our country. I mean, it's you wild. know, yeah. I, I mean, when we think about the life being endangered and, and, and when we think about, you know, being pro-life for me, I mean, how can we be pro-life and not care about the kids in cages, you know, and family, like kids being taken from their parents. I was just on the border in El Paso. So I'm not a single issue person. I want to be a champion for life, you know. Um, But, you know, there aren't a lot of Democrats that are comfortable talking about reducing abortions. You know, how can we most effectively reduce abortions and um, and care for mothers and and women's rights, you know. Um, and, And on the other side, I mean, there's a train wreck when it comes to a consistent ethic of life, um, that 105 lives being taken every day by guns. I mean, this is a pro-life issue. And, and two thirds of those are suicides that I think we can, we're not going to save every life, but I sure as heck think we can do better than 105 a day. I mean, it's unprecedented, you know, anywhere else in the industrialized world. So, and the same with the death penalty, like the countries that are executing people are Saudi Arabia, China, yep. Iran, Iraq. I mean, that's the company that we. It's keep, unthinkable you know? <laughs> for yeah, most of the just world. It blows the mind. I mean, I you know, uh, just the other day it hit me again. You know, we tell our kids all the time. I have three kids. They're amazing, but they're kids. They're wild. Yeah. And you know, they do things all the time that I'm like, what the? And so many times I catch myself telling them not to yell. Yeah. By yelling at them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. And then I'm in the I'm the words are coming out of my mouth in this elevated tone, which is not helpful in any way. And it hits me like just a ton of bricks right on my forehead. 
how are they ever going to take you seriously? Yeah. You want them to, you know, move forward on this issue of not yelling at your siblings, not, you know, doing things in this angry tone. And then just because you had a rough day or you've been traveling a lot or whatever, yeah. you yell at them to get them to stop yelling. Yeah. And I think that's utter foolishness. And yet, you know, we're doing that on such, like yelling is one thing. Yeah, I, can, yeah, yeah. I can apologize my way through yelling and I can get better. But killing people to punish them for killing yeah. has never made sense to me. Even growing up in a very fundamentalist Christian background, yeah. it has never, ever, ever made sense to me. Yeah. And yet we're still, by and large, it feels like, you know, I'm glad you think the needle is moving. And I, I do believe it is, but it's not, definitely not moving maybe at the, at the speed that would be, uh, oh, yeah, that, that I would love. Right. So by and large, the people that support our president and support some of his anti-life, uh, you know, proclamations and tweets and the things that he is for yeah. uh, very much for are Christians overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just wild to me. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's it's you know, it's been said that Donald Trump didn't change America. He re no. revealed yep. America. And I think the same is true of evangelicalism. Donald Trump didn't change it. He just revealed it. But when we think of the 81% of white evangelicals that voted for Trump, and, you know, it, it's it's very troubling that the same people that led me to Jesus have led us to Donald Trump. Um, and it's not that I'm anti-Trump as much as I'm pro-Jesus. And yet, almost every day, the tweets and policies of Donald Trump betray everything I see Jesus standing for. I like yes. the Beatitudes, where blessed are the merciful, the meek. <laughs> you know I mean? He's the antithesis of those. His life looks more like the seven deadly sins than the fruits of the Spirit. So anyway, I think, but you know, what, what it is, is that he's a symptom of a bigger disease. And I think what it goes back to is um, this idea that we can use violence to, to heal violence, even with guns. You know, it's like the answer to our gun problem is more guns. You go, man, it's like saying like, I have a drinking problem and I need more whiskey, you know, to kind of take care of that. And I think with the death penalty, it's very explicit. Like one of the most memorized Bible verses in the world, even among non-Christians, the verse that, if you say, say one Bible verse, it's often an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Yeah. And yet what's very interesting about that, I, I wrote a book dealing with, in part with that, this idea of just that was reciprocal harm. You could hurt someone as much as they hurt you, but as you really study it, it put a limit on revenge. It was, it was often called like reciprocal harm, you know, that you could hurt someone. If, if you poke my eye out, I could poke your eye out, you know. But what it did was it, it stopped the spiral of violence. So if you, you know, broke my arm, I couldn't go b break your arm and burn down your house. I could only do as much damage as you did to me. But you look at that and Jesus comes and blows it away. He goes, he, you've he heard it said. And I, it. he literally says, you've heard it said an eye for an eye for two, two, two for a two. But I want to show you an even better way. And it's kind of like that, that may be legal and acceptable, but like it's, we can do even better than mirroring the harm that was done to us. So the early Christians really got that, that this is a call to a totally do, new imagination about justice. And the best translation that we have for the word justice in the Bible is restorative justice, that it's about healing um, the, the wounds of violence. And you certainly don't, like even now, we would think it's cruel if you broke my arm, Nick, you know, that I, I can break your arm back. You know, yeah. like you wouldn't let your kids, you know, <laughs> do that. Hell no. And you go, so like, we don't rape people who rape to show that rape is wrong, but somehow in the most extreme case of murder, Taking a life. We, we, we somehow think that we can kill to show that it's wrong, and we end up doing the very same thing. It makes killers of all of us. Literally, if this execution goes forward this week, what it will say on the death certificate for manner of death is homicide. It is, that's exactly what's on the death certificate. We are killing someone as a state. And one of the early Christians said it incredibly. Cyprian, um, he's like first, you know, just a few hundred years into the church, he said, somehow we think it's evil if an individual kills another individual, but we think it's beautiful and justice if the state does it in mass. Like we mm. turn what, what we would always call evil for a person to do, we sanctify it when the state does it. And it's exactly what we do. You know, I mean, and, and it, it goes on a big scale too. Like, after September 11th, you killed 3,000 of our people, we're going to kill 100,000 of yours, you know? So, for, especially for those of us that are trying to follow, you know, orient our lives around Jesus. But even uh, for others, I think there's, there's just this reality that, no, actually, 
we, we don't mirror the evil that we're trying to heal the world of. We can do better than that. So I, I am optimistic. I mean, I think that, that I'm hopeful that 80% of millennial Christians are against the death penalty. Yeah. You know, there's a movement of young people yeah. in our country rising up against yeah. gun violence. Politicians have failed them. You know, like they're, I, I think our country is in a, uh, an incredibly historic moment in history and it's impossible impossible to be neutral right now, you know? Yeah. So when people say, like, if you wonder what you would be doing in Nazi Germany or during the civil rights movement, just watch what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah, that's that's wild. So you mentioned a few minutes ago that you're, you know, there's multiple issues that, you know, that you're excited about, that, that excited about tackling. One of them is uh, the issue of gun violence, right? And we, uh, last week, uh, within a span of eight days, there were three mass shootings here in America, the yeah. Gilroy Garlic uh, food festival, Walmart in El Paso, club in Dayton, Ohio. And um, in a matter of a few days, over 30 people, lives were taken and another 50 something injured because of gun violence. You have done quite a bit of work in that area as well by, again, not, I don't see Shane Claiborne out there um, yelling and screaming and getting angry all the time. Although maybe you feel like doing that sometime, I don't know. You are modeling a better way. How are you modeling a better way? You have actually taken, you take guns and you do what with them? Yeah, man. Well, which is um, just, it's, it's so fantastic. It, it is Every powerful, time I see yeah. you doing it, uh, you know, on social media, I just, I, I want to just yell like out loud. This, this is oh, what man. we should be doing. This is it. Yeah, I mean, so so we we've been turning guns into garden tools and other beautiful things. But we're we it's it's interesting because we didn't think of this. We we being um, uh, originally it's been like ten years or so since um, we did our first gun to plow transformation, and um, it's it's inspired by the biblical prophets Mike and Isaiah who talk about beating swords into plows and spears into pruning hooks. So we're turning, you know, repurposing metal, transforming um, our weapons and turning them into tools of life, tools that cultivate life, garden tools. So we got our, our first gun donated um, in Philly. Uh, it was actually on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. That's when we did our first one. I did it oh, with wow. Ben Cohen from Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream. Yes. And we dropped Ben and Jerry's buckets from helium balloons, you know, because we were imagining a world with more ice cream and less bombs. So we oh, dropped we dropped uh, buckets instead of bombs uh, of you know more ice cream. So uh, we but we also took this AK forty seven and my my metal crafter friend like tore it apart and turned it into a shovel and a, a rake, and it really felt like what we we began to do was more than symbolic. It was more than provocative. It was all that. I mean, it's artful, you know, it's what good art does, but it also was when we began to take more and more guns off the streets, um, because we found out we've got more guns than people in the United States. 122 guns for every hundred people, right? Yeah. Insane. In, insane. There's like nowhere else in the world that's anywhere near that, right? We've got 5% of the world's population and we have almost half of the world's civilian owned guns almost half the guns and we've got i'll stop but this is the last one is yeah. there's five times almost five times more gun dealers than mcdonald's restaurants so we've got a problem right man. so we thought man there's so many guns so people started donating them and we began um turning them into garden tools and now there's a whole network of blacksmiths including my wife um, where we're, we've got we've got a forge and everything in Philly. So you heat the metal up, you know, you beat on it, and you in the matter of an hour you can go from gun to garden tool. In fact, we can make three uh, hand trowels, and we make you know shovels and different tools for the garden. We can make like three of them out of a, a, an assault rifle. And but what we've also been doing is in, that's a beautiful picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you can take one weapon. Yeah, right. And make three tools that can give life like yeah. literally give life through the how you work the ground sorry i just yeah i just like, it's not even one for one it's one for three right like you you can produce so many more amazing beautiful life-giving tools uh than you can the weapons of destruction. totally man and what we've been doing though is we one of the first ones we did in philly uh, was with a hand uh gun that we found in an abandoned house and we had a bunch of moms and dads there who had lost their kids so we said you know what instead of just our blacksmiths let's let's invite let's invite the moms and dads you know and they took the hammer and i will never forget as this one mother began 
she had a picture of her son on her jacket and she just began pounding on this gun. And with every thump of the hammer, she said, this is for my boy. Mm. And we realized that what we are doing in these public demonstrations is that we're giving space for grief and public lament um, and honoring the trauma and pain of, of different folks in our community. So we just did a 37 city tour around our, uh, we, we did a book with this called Beating Guns, but my, my blacksmith buddy, uh, Mike Martin and I, we wrote the book together and he traveled with me and did all the blacksmithing. Amazing. And um, yeah, one of them, I mean, all over this country, we just, we saw this one guy, he counted 18 times, like really clearly, one, two, three. And then he just kind of pulled away. And afterwards he, he was really moved emotionally. And I, one of us was talking to him. He said, I counted 18 because I took the life of an 18 year old. And he's like, something in me was able to heal today, too. Man, and we, we just did one with uh, Reverend Sharon Risher, whose mother Amazing. was killed at Mother Emanuel AME yeah. Church, you know, when this yep. young, radicalized white supremacist went in, filled with hate, and killed them in the middle of prayer. And she named all nine of those, including her mother, her two cousins, one of her best friends. And it... It goes deeper than the stale rhetoric, right? And the debates and statistics, and we're trying to move people's hearts because I think that's what needs to happen in this country is that this is a political crisis, but it's also a moral crisis it and is. a spiritual crisis. It's a, it's a, it's a compassion crisis, right? Like the, it's a love crisis. Like when, when, when we are not moved to act after these mass shootings or after the, I mean, every day is a mass shooting, 105 lives a day. I mean, we've got, we've got shootings in our neighborhood almost every day that don't make the news, you know? Uh, so these are this, every one of these lives is a child of God that's cut short. Um, their lives cut short, and that that matters. So we're we're trying to move people with an urgency, and but also with a hope. You know that it doesn't have to be this way, and that's why you know this this guns to plow stuff. Walter Brueggemann, who is a dear friend, he wrote a great book called The Prophetic Imagination, and he says sometimes we get the prophets wrong, and we think that they were trying to predict the future, but they were actually trying to name the present and wake us up so that we can build a wow. different future from where we're headed. They they wow. weren't they weren't. Uh, fortune tellers they were truth tellers you know they were like really trying to wake us up and wake our hearts up so that we can realize like what we're doing to ourselves and, and help us invite us to reimagine the world and so when the prophets talk of beating swords into plows they're inviting us um to transform the world not just to transform a piece of metal but to transform our communities in our country to where it, it, we stand for life instead of death we protect people instead of guns Two questions. Yeah, I mean, One is... Sorry, I got to preach in there, man. Yeah. <laughs> no, please. Uh, I do not want to cut you off if you want to keep going. Two questions. One is, if somebody's sitting here listening, which I assume lots of people are, I, I, myself included, I've never owned a gun, I never will. But if I want a a plow that has been you know, transformed from a gun, where can I get one? Do I need to make <laughs> one? Like, how does this become... Yeah, yeah. How does this become a, a national and international movement where people... They might listen to this and say, well, that's amazing. That's something I can do. How do I do it? There's no blacksmith. Like, who even knows where a blacksmith yeah, yeah, is yeah. these days? Like, how do we get this, like, going? How does this totally, pick up man. momentum? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I um, it's funny that you say you don't have any guns because I got an entire basement full of guns right now, but they're all chopped up, you know? I <laughs> love it. they're ready to go. So Just people ready are ready to go. Them yeah. And, uh, um, but... We, we have a network now, and it's called Raw Tools, okay. which is war flipped backwards, right? So rawtools.org. Yes. And there are blacksmiths literally all over the country that are ready to take guns and, and the metal from that and repurpose it. So we've got them out in the Northwest, up in uh, New England, uh, here in Tennessee, um, in Philly. So they can go, folks can go to rawtools.org and see that disarming network because there's also places that are... I guess you would say safe drop zones, or I call them chop saw churches because some of them are churches that literally what we do is we have a chop saw on site or we have someone that will meet them on church property. And we use church property because it's 
kind of a safe space, yeah. you know, yeah. like we don't just want people bringing guns into places where they, you can't take them into a police station necessarily. Right. So you yep. just come to a church and we'll chop them up or there's other community centers. So yeah, the best thing to do is go to rawtools.org and we're making them as quick as we can. We got more and more blacksmiths that we're kind of apprenticing and rising up. In fact, I just learned to blacksmith, man. So I'm, I'm now able to do it myself. Made my first tool um, Amazing. Uh, about a month ago. So I've been making them ever since. And you said yeah. your wife is also a blacksmith? Yeah, she's training, man. That's she's a awesome. blacksmith in training. She don't mess around. So we're That's making awesome. like little necklaces, uh, heart necklaces out of the barrel of a gun. We're making shovels out of uh, some of the long guns. Um, and, and people keep getting creative. I just saw a, uh, one of our blacksmiths is making tractors for kids that are made out of the chopped up uh, chamber of a revolver, you know. So we're making all kinds of beautiful stuff. And, uh, um, and you know, folks can also go to beatingguns.org, and we've got a bunch of connections there. Let's begin to wrap up. I want to yeah, be respectful dude. of your time. There's people waiting to talk to you, and you've got a whole group of people here. Uh, I mean, I could talk to you for forever. We'll, I will do we'll, it again soon, we'll, man. We'll find yeah. again. But right now, so we're in very, um, we've mentioned it a couple times in different ways. These are very volatile times. And uh, politically, societally, like spiritually, the whole, there's so many issues. It feels so heavy. Every day feels heavy, man. Yeah. I, I, know, I know you feel that. I am not an optimistic person by nature. I know that if you look at the statistics, if you look around, this is the best, safest, blah, 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 time in his, all of history. I get that. Like if you look at what's happened in the past and what's happening now or what's not happening now, that's not where my brain goes. I'm an yeah, Enneagram yeah, yeah. 8. I'm a protector, challenger. Like I will uh, leave the optimistic mindset so quickly if someone is hurting, if someone needs help. And that's where I've always gone. And um, that means that I spend a lot of time, too much time um, angry. But I know that's not helpful either because angry people, they don't get as much, I shouldn't say they don't get anything done, but they don't get as much done as people who channel all the things they're taking in into, and not to say that I don't act, I do a lot of acting, but it's acting out of anger. And so I've, I've pissed off way too many people that probably didn't need to piss off. Like I could have actually worked with them or I just always tend toward letting everything that's welling up turn into, yeah, this kind of demeanor that is not so fun to be around. And I'm, I'm getting better, thankfully, and I have a lot of people around me <laughs> pressing on me and helping me. But by and large, my trajectory has not been, you know, toward compassion first. Compassion comes at some point, but it's just, it's just anger. I don't want to be that Let's way, Let's give a damn. Yeah, I don't want to be that way. I <laughs> yeah, want yeah, to be no. someone that responds with, like, takes it all in, whether it's, you know, I'm the, I'm the son of an immigrant that came here from Guatemala. Like, I... These are my people that are being hurt and harmed. And I see these videos of little kids that went to school, first day of, first day of fucking school in Mississippi, and they come out, dad and mom are not there. They got scooped up at the yeah. factory. Nobody's going out to the factory owner right, right, who right. Yeah. hired them. Nobody's talking about the lawsuit they just, that they just settled at that same factory for, I forget what the, I think it was like sexual harassment, all this. Nobody's talking about that. They're just talking about these illegal immigrants, these undocumented, I don't yeah. want to call them illegals, uh, yeah. but they're these undocumented. That's what people say, yeah. yeah these undoc so there's so much to be angry at. How, I'll stop talking now. The question is, how should we respond? As Christians and non-Christians alike, I am a Christian, you're a Christian, a lot of people listening, uh, we have you know Muslims and Baha'i and Jewish. Uh, yeah. Do we have all sorts of people and people that don't adhere to any religious faith? How do we respond? Mm. How do we make sure that we can move the needle more? How do we make sure that uh, we can speak into what our current administration is doing and our next the next administration, whoever that may be? What do you propose as yeah. a way forward? Well, first of all, I, th I think that that anger is a a, a very natural. Uh, response to what's happening in our country, in our world right now. Um, in fact, if we're if we're not angry, then we're probably not paying attention to what's happening. I mean, mm. there's so much craziness that's that's um, out there. Um, but I, my prayer is always that my anger would be holy, and that it would be channeled into constructive change. You know, and that's what I'm always trying to figure out is how can I channel that. And so, like when I'm beating the crap out of an AR-15 at the forge, like you better believe I'm angry. You know, like we had a. This is not. This is not like just random news stories. We had uh, a, a military style weapon, one block, 50, 50 feet from my house that shot 39 rounds in less than a minute. Two people were killed, and it could have been tons more. Sure. Right. Like so we ha we are angry um 
I, there's a song that sometimes we sing on the marches that we are a gentle, angry people. But th- that's mm. also my prayer is that we, we, because I don't think that anger alone can fuel us. I think love has to fuel us, but not the sentimental love of storybooks, like Dostoevsky said, the right. harsh and dreadful the love, the kind of love that keeps us up at night, the love that says like, um, uh, if, if there's kids in cages right now, maybe we need to be like going to jail for shutting those detention centers down, right? So I think that that's where the question is kind of what does love require of us right now? And, and how can um, we grow nearer to those who are hurting? And, and I think like in the end, the more I talk to people, I mean, I'm still down with folks, half my family are gun owners in the NRA and things like that, that don't agree with me on things. But we're like, part of what I think I I constantly know is that we've got to move people with the stories of those who are hurting right now. We've Mm -hmm. got to amplify the voices of those who are suffering the brunt of these injustices. I don't know too many people that get argued into thinking differently. You know, that they're like, you throw a Bible verse at them and they're like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. In fact, I come to think of it, I don't like guns, you know, (laughs) or you just convince me I'm against the death penalty. I mean, sometimes that can happen, but like, man, I mean, to me, it's the stories of, 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 of folks that, so, so that's why I think like sometimes our compassion problem begins with that proximity problem. Yeah. Like, and, and so we got to get people a little closer to the pain. And in the end, that's what Jesus does. I mean, Jesus like enters the world as a refugee, a, you know, a, a Jewish Palestinian yes. refugee born in the middle of a genocide as the empire he's born into is separating kids from their parents, is killing the children. Like that's exactly what Jesus enters into, being executed on a cross. And so my entire understanding of Jesus is this this movement of God towards the suffering of the world so that Jesus is absorbing all of that violence and transcending it with love, showing us a way that we can interact in an evil world without becoming evil and violent ourselves. And we're all prone, like Jesus' right-hand man, Peter, to pick up, Peter picks up a sword to defend Jesus, yep. and he gets rebuked, you know, and Jesus says, no, you're still not getting it, you know? So I think it's it's okay to feel angry, but then, like, always to have that checked by our, our love, and also to go, like, like sometimes we get angry because we're not near to the people too, you know, like this is, these are just, and so I, I always like when I was down in El Paso a few weeks ago, like the folks there, like we were at a detention center. We went to an encampment of 200 families there and they are angry, but they were also like hopeful. Like they're the fruits of the spirit, joy, gentleness, kindness all was all over them. So I want to stay near to that, you know? And, um, and in, in, in the end, I, I, a part of what I believe is that Governor Lee can be moved with compassion and yes. mercy. Like, I believe, like, when I was in Texas, this guy came up to me and he goes, man, I got to tell you, I'm confessing it. I'm a redneck. He says, I'm, you know, textbook, pickup truck, tobacco chewing, whiskey drinking, gun toting, redneck. And he said, but I've been reading some of your stuff. It's got me read my Bible. And then he goes, and, and it has messed me up. He says, it's got me thinking. He said, I wanted to pray with you because uh, I'm a recovering redneck. Mm. <laughs> you know? So one of my, you know, one of my, my, my thoughts is like, man, if, if, if we don't believe in, sometimes it's easy to believe in redemption for folks on death row, but not to believe in the redemption of a governor or a, you know, recovering redneck. And so like, we always got to hold out hope that someone can be be, be made um, into a new creation, that someone's heart can be moved with compassion. And I know that because I spent a lot of my life in, the, in a sheltered world where I think my story could have ended really differently, you know I mean? Um, and I'm, I'm always trying to surround myself with people who both have the fire in their bro- bones to bring about change, but they also have that, that love in them, you know? And um, so that's uh, the holy cocktail of anger and love. I think that's what we need right now. <laughs> Gen- gentle anger. <laughs> yeah. That's a beautiful way to describe it. Yeah. That's that's the kind of angry I want to be. Yeah, what has that old song? He's a, we are a gentle, angry people, and we're fighting, fighting for our lives. I've never so heard that, good song. but that's yeah. like my gentle, new anthem. Angry people. I'm going to go look it up. <laughs> I'm going to go look it up and just like, maybe I'll get it tattooed you know, somewhere <laughs> so that I can be reminded of it. This has been amazing. It's um, awesome. Again, man. it's I, always I, good like, to be together, I, man. I, I thank you coming I admire, out. I admire you. Degree weather. You know, if you want to track where we're up to, you can um, text March the number four Mercy March for Mercy to three three seven seven seven, 
that sounds really technical, but I, I'm, I'm new to all this technology. People but, will get it, and, people, I'll, and I'll say it again in the yeah, intro and people, outro. I mean, more than anything, we, we just want, uh, we're more together than we are on our own, and we need yeah, we the, the, the folks that believe in some of the stuff that's hurting so many of our brothers and sisters, some of that is very organized, and we need to, we need to be even more organized for love and compassion. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to be with you, man. Thank glad, you for, glad for all your man. listeners, the folks that are, um, you know, that, that are Christians and the folks that aren't. I think it's, it's you know, I'm glad that they listened in and we yeah, can all be working together, man. It's yeah. been fun because the people listening right now to your voice, to my voice, I hear from them every week after they listen. You know, they're hitting me up on text, on email, on, you know, DMing me on Instagram. And they're saying that the stories truly change their lives. And I want this one, I want this conversation to cause, I wanna see people, I'm not trying to change everybody's hearts and lives in the direction that they're headed in their life, but I wanna see guns yeah, man. disappear after this conversation. Yeah. I wanna see people begin to make more chatter around the idiocy of the death penalty. And I wanna see more people uh, begin to follow what you and your wife and the simple way are doing. So uh, this was super fun, Jay. Yeah, awesome, dude. Thanks for joining us today, friends. We discussed some heavy topic matter today. So if you have any questions or thoughts, hit me up via email, hello at letsgiveadam.com or hit up Shane and me on social media. Shane is on Twitter and Facebook at Shane Claiborne. Also hit up his website, shaneclaiborne.com to check out all that he is involved in and doing and what's to come. As always, you can find links and more information about this podcast conversation and all things Let's Give a Damn by going to letsgiveadam.com. If you love what we're doing on the show, please tell a friend or 10 friends. Leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts or consider sending a few dollars our way each month to support the production of this show by going to patreon.com slash letsgiveadam. That's patreon.com slash letsgiveadam. This podcast episode was created by Chad Snavely and yours truly. The music is by our friend and fellow damn giver, Propaganda. I can't wait to spend time with you next week, friends. Love you all. Peace. <laughs>